Today on the Musings of Rin, I've decided to continue with the series of discussions on propaganda. It's a topic many people don't understand and fall prey to, so it's important to build up our awareness to protect ourselves from it. This time, we'll take a look at one of our historical cultural heroes, Hercules. Like most people, I grew up liking this guy. Our North American culture had two sanitized versions of myth, the Kevin Sorbo television series and the Disney cartoon, both from the 90s. But if you get the chance to study the classical mythology version, it's quite a bit different. Folks over the ages have propped this man up and worshipped his accomplishments without really understanding who he was, how he lived, and why he was doing what he was doing. So today I'll be walking you through the original myths and comparing that to history and archaeology to uncover the truth about the origins of Pericles. Where did the story come from? And why were they preparing to tell his story? It's a lot of content, so I've split the talk into two parts. Next month, I'll continue with his adventures and what the propagandas were surrounding them. Let's start by setting up an understanding about his origins, specifically his family bloodline and how they entered Greece. Heracles descends from the line of Perseus, but if we step back to his family origin in Greece, the first man to arrive was called Danaeus. He was the tenth king of Argus. He was originally a king of Libya, who took the rulership of Argos from a man named Gelinor. Gelinor had welcomed Danaeus and his daughters as migrants when they were escaping the Sumerian overpopulation wars and camping Egypt. Danaeus came to Greece trying to sell his daughters after the death of their husbands. So they may not have been his real daughters, but just women traveling with him as wards. He might have been either a slaver or a human trafficker, trying to place migrant women into homes and marriages. They arrived around 1450 BC. His wife was one of his own people from Libya, named Elphantis. So he did not enter Greece by marrying into a local bloodline from the community. He married his daughter, Hypermenestra, to his brother Egyptus' son. Lysenus. They were also from Libya. So he ended up ruling Argos after the man who had allowed him entry, but none of that man's bloodlines were allowed to continue ruling. It looks like he came in and his family took over as foreign conquerors. Not the best way to start a migration experience. Danaeus entered Greece during the time of Amenhotep. This pharaoh of Egypt took reign shortly after dispelling the invasion of the migrant Hyksos which is essentially the Sumerian overpopulation blockade. They were sitting between Egypt and Mesopotamia, which was thought to be Punt, the slaver communities. These folks sat in Canaan, which is today's Israel. If we look at the depiction in hieroglyphs, the Hyksos were painted as red-skinned men. We see them on the walls of the tombs of Hatshepsut, that they were boating them in large numbers back to Punt, which looks like they were attempting to deport prisoners of war as slaves back to the culture that birthed them. It's quite possible that Danaeus was a wealthy slaver or a human trafficker trying to profit on moving folks out of the war zone. Maybe they were setting up brothels or fertility temples to move women across the seas so they couldn't be used to produce overpopulating men surrounding Egypt. It sounds like Greece tried to be diplomatic and take in his family and the women migrants, but not the problematic men attacking them. Unfortunately, Danaeus turned around and backstabbed them, took the city for their kindness, and moved in his extended family. Now, Argos was the seat of power for the goddess Hera on mainland Greece. She was the goddess of matrimony, a symbol of fertility temples and this organization of marriage matches. Was her deity created by these peoples? Was it a symbol of trying to move or sell migrant women? Today we see the concept of male order brides. Perhaps these folks were the ones who originated that idea. So why did Galenor allow this man entry into Argos? It's obvious he made a mistake and these people became a problem. Well, Danaeus claimed that he descended from Apophis, who was an Egyptian king who was the son of a woman named Io. Io had fled from Hera, where her organization was founded in Crete. 
after she was impregnated with a child of Zeus. So basically they're claiming he was at least distantly related to Greek peoples, that their leader Zeus um, owed them some obligation to take care of them. They claimed the Greek peoples created their family line. Now Io fled the wrath of Hera for breaking population controls and essentially having a child out of wedlock. Nobody wanted to support the child, not the goddess administrator of her temple or the baby daddy who impregnated her, so she fled alone without sponsorship to Egypt. This is where her son propped himself up to be a ruler of part of that region. Was any of this true or not? Was Danaeus actually a Greek person? If we step back to archaeology and real history, we know this is a time of slavers and slavery. In 3500 BC, there were those slave trade tablets in Ur. Those folks conquered and set up the first dynasty of Egypt in 3100 BC when their scorpion king of Punt placed figurehead Narmer on the throne and divided the region between his wife's four children. We know that in Egypt and across the Middle East and Northern Africa, they were taking slaves from surrounding cultures to build monuments, work farms and ranches, and fill brothels. It's quite possible this husbandless mother who migrated or came to Egypt was brought to Crete as a slave woman of unknown racial origin, that she was working in a fertility temple and sold her services to a man who visited the temple to create this child Apophis. If this was a fertility temple, she might have been servicing multiple men in an international trading city. The father could have also been of unknown racial origin and not actually Greek. The fact that the woman fled back to Egypt tells you either she was of Egyptian origin returning home or she was sold to an Egyptian ruler after becoming impregnated. It's also possible she was taken as a slave by slavers who attacked Crete to work brothels in Egypt. Women prisoners of war were often raped when they were sold into slavery. At this point in the story, it's not clear if the folks running these fertility temples were Greeks, Egyptians, or Sumerians. But we do know the concept of slavery moved out from Ur in Sumeria. The text and the names of the slavers were written in Aramaic. From these stories, it implies the bloodline was created by foreigners moving into Greece. They might have lied about having a European bloodline or had gained it through using trickery via slavery, the taking of Greek women, or brothels selling services to Greek men. They took away the child to be indoctrinated in Egypt in their ways. Let's fast forward five generations to Perseus, Heracles' most famous ancestor. He was the grandson of Acrisius, the 13th ruler of Argos. He did not have a male heir. He was the last king of his bloodline. His daughter was said to have been sent across the seas in a chest after being impregnated by Zeus. So again, we have a woman carrying a child of Zeus. Let's step back and recall this might have simply meant a Greek baby. The child might have been an obligation or responsibility of Zeus to care for as a ward of state. How many migrant women are there in your country today claiming the fathers of their babies are your citizens? Perhaps history was repeating itself in this bloodline, or they were using the story from the former ruler. Did the Argos brothel lose or sell a woman who fled this time to the Greek island of Seraphos? The child, Perseus, was raised by a fisherman. He was the brother of the ruler of that island. Was Argos, the seat of power for Hera, simply a city built around that brothel or fertility temple? Now Perseus is famous. His myths have been transcribed into movies as well, which are their own forms of propaganda. You might have heard of Clash of the Titans from 1981, and the more modern versions from the 2010s, Clash and Wrath of the Titans. I won't go through all of his myths, but I will focus on his bloodline so we understand the origins of this family. Perseus married Andromeda, a princess of Ethiopia, whom he liberated from a sea serpent on behalf of her father, the king. She was given to him as a reward. If you'll recall, my last talk was about the Sword of Light propaganda myths. 
In this series, there's actually another story that depicts a similar experience to Perseus's acquisition of Andromeda. This story is called The Thirteenth Son and the King of Erin. It was originally told in Ireland. In it, a king had thirteen sons. One day, they witnessed a swan driving away one of its thirteen signets. This is a swan child, essentially. The seer explained that to fall under heaven's will, you need to send away one child. It implied that the seer was telling them to deal with overpopulation, explaining how in nature, animals survive by throwing their children out to the wild. Now, the king loved all his sons equally, and he couldn't choose one to discard. So he decided to simply evict the last child who returned that evening. It was Sean Ruad. He was the eldest. He asked his father to be given clothing for the road, and was granted that and a black horse that could run faster than the wind. Now from the last story of the Swords of Light, horses could talk. They were basically people. They were using symbolic terminology. So we might think he took a slave or local migrant with him that knew the African territories to guide him or aid him in his travels. Maybe the horse folks were human traffickers boating him across to new lands. Sean put on some poor clothing and went to work for a king to herd his cows. His employer, the king, told him that a sea serpent stole his daughter, much like the story of Perseus. A king's daughter was demanded every seven years. Maybe this was tribute to a more powerful military nation. This year, his child was chosen, and he didn't want to give her up. Many king's sons had promised to save this woman, but the king didn't think they would be successful, so he was trying to get Sean to go save her for him. If we recall from the last Sword of Light story again, the adventures or descent into criminal mayhem always started with a man trying to lure another man to win a bride. This story wasn't that different. His employer was sending him to a woman held in a brothel. Three giants lived near the king's lands. Sean moved his herd to pastures on each of their lands, and over three days fought with them. They promised to give their swords of light and horses to him if he would spare their lives. But he said, I don't have to do that. He just killed them and took their lands. He didn't follow the instructions his propaganda puppet masters tried to get him to follow. He didn't play along with the brothel stories. The housekeepers were slaves, glad to be free, and were happy to give him the household treasures. His employer's cows produced more milk than they used to. If you know anything about mammals and milk, you know this means that in order to produce milk, the cows were pregnant. If, like the horses, the cows were actually women, then you know they were having too many children and keeping them per perpetually pregnant. So the cow folks were the overpopulators in this region, and Sean was removing the peoples who were taking cow women away, said to be these giants. Maybe they were wealthy men saving women and giving them jobs, or maybe they were buying them as slaves, but not having children with them. On the fourth day, Sean dressed in the black clothing of the first giant. He took his black horse and visited the princess on the shores, awaiting the sea serpent. Now, at the time of the Bronze Age, folks who dressed in black clothing were Norse Germanics. They used dark leathers. Leathers were manufactured by the hides of animals. So it's possible that this giant was a local man, or that they were foreign competitors for ranching or hunting. The princess took three hairs from his head and spent time with him in the brothel, cough, until the serpent arrived. So we know Sean had a unique hair color, unique enough to identify him. Sean was recognizable as a foreigner, and it was not something that was common to the woman he visited. His last name was Ruad. In Scottish, this means red, so perhaps he was named after his hair color. This hair color is most frequently found in northern Europe, but there are many Ethiopian native tribes that still use red ochre today to dye their hair. When the serpent arrived, they fought, and Sean defeated the creature by cutting off its head. It immediately grew back, though, and the sea serpent fled to collect itself. 
This implies that Sean killed the brothel or temple master when he was, you know, discovered. But he just left the woman there. He used her services but didn't take her as a wife. Thought maybe what? She'd go back to her father on her own? Anyway, this didn't happen. So on the fifth day, he dressed in the blue clothing of the second giant. He took his brown horse and visited the princess again. The earliest blue dyes were made of woad by Celts in Europe and by indigo in Asia and Africa. So the second man he killed surrounding his master's territories was either a wealthy Celt, African, or Asian. Indigo was farmed in plantations, and plantations often used slaves. It was also a waste of water to create plants for dyes over food. So maybe he was taking out a competitor for his own master's water source. The princess again noticed that his hair was the same as the hair she took before, so she recognized him. This time he cut the sea serpent in half, but the halves joined. The serpent retreated again, saying, I will be back. So he killed the brothel master twice, and he left the brothel again, where the woman stayed. He's not doing a very good rescue job, is he here? Did he think his job was to defeat the serpent and not bring back the daughter? Was he misunderstanding his instructions, or was that the intention the whole time? On the sixth day, he dressed in the many-colored clothing of the third giant with its glass boots and rode its red horse. Now, the Jew's story of the multicolored robe of Joseph comes much later in the timeline, not at the time of Perseus. At this time, the multicolored clothing would have belonged to the Minoans, whose primary base of operation was in Crete. This is where Hera's temple that Io had fled from was founded. Glass boots didn't exist until much later in history as well, in England. But Minoans wore sandals. You see through glass, and sandals use straps, so you could see the feet between the straps. So maybe these were glass boots. Often they were specifically fitted to a custom foot shape, so as not to harm the wearer. During the time of Perseus, Minoans were migrating to Greece, Asia Minor, and Crete. Perhaps these were the three giants being attacked. They were being invaded by Sumerian overpopulation with brown-colored skin. If Sean could wear the custom-fit sandals of a Minoan giant or wealthy landowner in this region, he might have had Minoan heritage, similar to the third giant he killed. They are appearing to use the term giant for rulers of diverse European peoples who were attacked by Sumerians. In this story, the three giants were a Norseman, a Celt, and a Minoan. These would have been all of the people surrounding Crete who overpopulation was being pushed into from Africa. Now, he was being continually sent to the serpent's house, which we saw was on the shores. Heracleon in Crete was on the northern shores, and it was a hub for trade and travel. Gnosis was a palace to the south of the city, thought to be linked to fertility and marriage rights. The Gnosis Palace was built in 2000 BC after the removal of the Minoans here, when their civilization was declining. Was it a brothel? Was it formed by their invaders? Around it formed the largest population center on the island. It was famous for its bull and minotaur myths, so we can see the cow peoples that Perseus worked for took over this region. This time, the housekeeper warned him that the serpent would only be defeated if he threw a brown apple down its mouth, implying he needed to be poisoned. Now, apples were often associated with fertility, maybe pregnant women. It implies that Io might have been that brown apple. She might have been a brown-skinned woman. She might have been taken to the temple in Egypt to trade for Andromeda to gain her freedom. This implies Io was either South Asian or a mixed-blooded African. She was not a European woman. When he arrived, again, the princess recognized him by his hair. He did as the housekeeper told him, and the serpent melted away into jelly. 
Analogy-wise, it implies Io seduced the brothel manager, that they made a successful trade. Io was happy to be there, and they were happy to take the princess back home. The princess took one of Sean's glass boots so that she could identify him, and he went back to his employment. The story doesn't tell us directly, but it implies she went separately and returned to her father. Now, many men came to her father and her wanting a reward for defeating the serpent, so they lied about doing it. She couldn't match them to the sandal, so she refused them. The king basically was surrounded with people who wouldn't be considered Minoan or similar enough in build to be related to Sean. Perhaps they were claiming to be his son in some sort of identity theft. Sean had visited a brothel and he left behind all these sons and now you have to take care of them because Sean is your, you know, citizen. They sent them to Sean. He overpowered and defeated them. They sent another 20. He defeated them as well. It implies the king was telling these men he knew Sean was the real liberator and he should go deal with him directly if they thought he was their father. Now this started to become problematic. The seer told the king, talk to Sean directly. He allowed the man to leave his workplace and be summoned to the princess. So he did. They identified him by the boot. So the man who showed up was either Sean or his descendant with valid heritage and the ability to claim rewards for their father's deeds. He was told that the men were pursuing him because they claimed to have saved her instead of him. In these times, your life continued through your bloodline. You were your child. So it's possible they were claiming his inheritance or they wanted his place in this civilization or society. But Sean had successfully cut off all their heads so there were no men left claiming to be his child. So they knew, wait, hold on a sec, you don't have a child. So he got married to the princess and she was taken back to the giant's lands he acquired. They wanted him, this worthy hero and savior, to produce at least one heir. So, was this story about Perseus, or was this a common pattern occurring at this time in history? The man was tricked by a king into going to a brothel owned by a man who used serpent symbology as his identifier to meet with a princess, and in return for visiting the brothel and defeating its owners and all the sons and servants, he was then allowed to marry an Ethiopian princess. It implies that Crete was invaded by brown-skinned Ethiopians, that these were the peoples displacing the Minoans, that the Ethiopians were the cow peoples of Mesopotamia. Crete was one of the three lands of the giants that Sean acquired. The Perseus story claimed Poseidon sent a flood and the sea serpent for boasting that Andromeda was more beautiful than any other woman. Would a brothel not be making the same claim to get men to visit and spend money in their halls? If you'll remember from my Sumerian overpopulation talk, Poseidon was seen by the Vedics in India as a dark-skinned man with red hair, an Ethiopian with red ochre-dyed hair. He held a five-pronged trident, essentially a pitchfork. So either these men were impersonating Minoans as Ethiopians, or Poseidon was created off the image of this man. Now Egypt also had a Heracleon, known as Thonis, on the coast of the Mediterranean, but this city dates to later in 1200 BC, at the time of the Trojan War. This is a time also linked to Heracles. Now Thonis was built into the islands around the mouth of the Nile around a temple similar to the Sword of Light myth placing a temple directly on the shores. It was the main port for international trade in the area. The temple was dedicated to Khonsu, god of the moon. He was a son of Amun, thought to be Heracles himself. Amun was the god who arose after the Hyksos invasion when he merged with Ra in 1600 BC. This is just before Danaeus brought his slave daughters to Greece. They started to associate Amun with the Greek Zeus, who performed a similar role as a father ruling deity. It's quite possible Heracles being a child of Zeus simply meant he was from 
a city like Heracleon, ruled by a temple master, a Zeus, who was a ward of children, that Heracles' line descended from Ethiopian conquerors of the Minoans who took Crete and set up brothels at Knossos and Heracleon in Egypt for international travelers. These businesses created children, which they sold as slaves, and a flood of migrants and unwanted orphans surrounded them in the region. It looks like the brothels were dumping children when they came of age if they couldn't sell them. They were just throwing them to the winds. So the brothels themselves were very likely creating the problem. They were expecting their Zeus, or their ruling caste god, to just take care of them. It's your problem now, not ours. We created them, but we're just a corrupt business. It's not our problem. It's yours now. Sorry. So, yeah. We can see this is not a successful business plan, and it actually destroys every community it would have entered. We know that the floods were caused by the tsunamis from the volcanic eruptions of Santorini. They think it was around 1700 BC. Tsunamis would have reached Crete and displaced folks across the region. It's possible that orphan migrants took this opportunity to claim the lands of Crete that were abandoned due to the flooding, rather than allow their original owners to return to them. These folks were pushing Minoans into Argos, the mainland Greece and Asia Minor, bringing with them Danaeus and his daughters from Libya to found the line of Hercules. Now, was Danaeus a Minoan or an Ethiopian? If he was a Minoan, the Greeks might have thought they were their peoples. If they were Ethiopians, they would have had to convince the Greeks they had Minoan blood to be allowed entrance. Perhaps the Greeks just wanted the women. The slaver folks were just good marketers for their businesses, and nobody at the time knew the consequences of overpopulation. Or slavery, for that matter. It is very likely not a coincidence that the Thera volcano, the Hyksos invasion, the raising up of Amun-Ra and Khonsu, and the arrival of Danaeus in Greece was all happening at the same time during the Sumerian overpopulation. Now, was Perseus really related to Danaeus? Or was he just using his con, and he was coming from Syria? Some people believe Perseus founded Mycena, just to the north of Argos, around 1300 BC. He married an Ethiopian princess. Were they trying to be diplomatic and end migration wars? Was Perseus just a figurehead for his wife and her bloodline? Or did two warring parties on the mainland, Syria and the Mesopotamian Ethiopians decide to join hands and screw somebody else for a change. Now we know Perseus had seven sons, much like the Jewish Noah's son Japheth. He also had seven sons. Now if we look at Noah's grandsons, it's very interesting that these migration wars occurring in the region map to Jewish mythology and where these grandsons were allocated. We'll start with Ham's four kids. Kush was in Upper Egypt, or what became Ethiopia, the source of these, you know, invading peoples. Mizraim was in Lower Egypt, or what became location of this brothel in Heracleon. Fut was in Punt, possibly Eritrea, Saudi Arabia, or more likely Mesopotamia, the home or source of slavery. Canaan was assigned his namesake territory, which became Israel, which is the disputed region that was being blockaded by the Hyksos. These sons mapped to the Ethiopian invasion of Egypt, where Narmer and his scorpion king Punt, Ethiopian allies, displaced Ka and Raha here. Basically, the lands were granted to the four sons of the early dynasty of Egypt in 3100 BC, and his line reigned until 2700 BC. It kind of implies these propagandas of both Greek mythologies of Heracles and the Sword of Light series in Celtic regions are sourced in Jewish propagandas. That Jews started out as overpopulating Ethiopians in Africa, marrying into lighter-skinned regions and impersonating wealthy or prominent European folks. Now, after taking Egypt, they moved on to wreak havoc in the Middle East with Shem and his sons. Elam in southern Iran, Asher in Assyria, Arpashad in Mesopotamia, and Lud in western and northern Iran, which would have been the Hurrian kingdoms, 
and Aram in Ebla. These grandsons mapped to the Akkadian invasion of Mesopotamia, occurring between 2700 and 2300 BC. Southern Iran was conquered first, in 2700 BC, by a Sumerian king. They next took over Assyria, in 2600 BC. Then Uruk, Ebla, and Hurrian territories were absorbed between 2300 BC and 2200 BC. When we get to Japheth, his seven kids were found in Syria, Lydia, Iran, Greece, Northern Africa, Phrygia, and the Sea Peoples who attacked Egypt, who got placed in Saudi Arabia. These grandsons of Noah mapped to the Bronze Age collapse and the Trojan Wars. Heracles, according to myth, participated in the Trojan Wars. Was Heracles a propaganda tool used by Jewish folks for migratory expansion? Was it a pattern to follow in order to successfully, you know, invade another culture? If we compare Japheth's seven sons to Perseus' seven sons, his sons are in a little bit of a different region, but we see a similar problem. Perseus' sons were Perses, linked to the Kassites in Syria. Helias, linked to the Lepconian region in southern Greece. Cenurus, linked to the Cenurian region. Mestor, linked to the Alis region. Alceus was married to the queen of Iolcus. Stathenelus was the one who inherited Mycena and Tyrans after the death of his brother, Electron. And Electron had nine sons and an illegitimate son by a Phrygian and all of his sons ended up dead. It's interesting that one of Perseus' sons stayed behind in Syria, and the rest of them were led by their father to invade Greece. It implies that Perseus was a Syrian, and his original lands went to his namesake son. Was Perseus Gover then, or Javan? Were they the people operating a brothel in Perseus' original territories? His son Perses went on to found the Persians, which founded the Islamic movement. The Persian invasions of the Mitanni Empire created the Hittites, Sea Peoples, Dorians, and Sumeranians. They pushed into Greece as the Dorian invasion, and then later caused the migration into Asia Minor as the Ionian migration. Now all of these resulting migrations are hitting the regions linked to Japheth's seven sons. Now, is it the pride and ego of Hebrew or Jewish people saying that all humans descend from Noah? Are they claiming that everyone born in these regions were children of these brothels? I think that's a bit um, overextending. I don't think every woman was a slave at a temple. I don't think all Europeans were born of a brothel. Celtic civilization, for example, started in the British Isles in 3200 BC. This is way before these brothels were even created. Now, to date the time of the Gnostic brothel, we know the palace was built around 2000 BC. So it implies these conflicts started then. And this sits in either Javan's Greece region or Tiras's Sea Peoples region. Perhaps one of these two men were that sea serpent. Remember, Poseidon reigning over this region looked like a Vedic storm god Adad, an Ethiopian man impersonating a red-haired Poseidon. Now, each wave of these grandsons of Noah appears to have been placed in a major surrounding foreign regional power, where some migratory war occurred, and each time it was after they pushed migrants into the region and either created a slave house, a brothel, or a fertility temple in some sort of international trading port. And then they took over the economy and businesses and shoved out the local peoples. It's very possible that the slaver fertility temple owners were the folks spreading the Jewish religion, that the line of Perses left behind spread the Islamic one. Their business was selling people. They bred them and they sold them for work or sex. They used the brothels and temple sites to move the overpopulation into different regions as human traffickers. And once they had enough allied descendants, those brothel masters took over these regions. 
This is very similar to Islamic indoctrinations today. If you interview a person, I think there was one who in Milan, for example, he said they are committed to overpopulation. That's their way. They're going to rule and conquer their European overlords. It, it's something they still do today. Perhaps the grandsons of Noah are symbolic. They're not actually, you know, a family. It represents the line that birthed migratory slave conquerors. They're pointing out their regions of responsibility in a slightly coded fashion. It is a strange coincidence though, isn't it? We can use the timeline and see the outward movement of these grandsons from Ethiopia through Africa, the Middle East, and pushing towards Europe. So Ethiopian Jews are using propaganda surrounding Heracles to create entitlement to access land and resources their own peoples couldn't provide themselves. They were overextended by creating overpopulation. They bred excess peoples. Nobody wanted to buy them. And they didn't want to be poor trying to take care of these peoples themselves. So they sent them to attack the surrounding regions claiming, well, you were using our brothels, they're your kids now, ha ha ha. It, it's very unlikely that the people who were arriving had any relations to the peoples they were attacking. They were just desperate for resources. Heracles was yet another child of Zeus, born to a woman in this bloodline, Alcmene. Her father was Electrion, the man with many sons who ruled Tyrants. They started constructing the Acropolis of Tyrants in 1500 BC, the same time ancestor Danaeus showed up in Argos. Myth tells us that Perseus's granduncle Proteus built this city after bringing a giant or cyclops from Lycaea in Asia Minor. So somebody ported a European man to help them build a city. This city was attacked at the end of the Bronze Age, around the time of the Trojan Wars. It's possible that at this point it became a site of a brothel or fertility temple. In Tiryns, lower town, they found signs that in 1100 BC, gold, silver, and a 1500 BC Minoan signet ring and other jewelry were being hoarded or made there. Perhaps they were reproducing fake rings for identity theft at a time of high migration. Likely the Minoans' Ethiopian Jewish invaders were the fertility temple or brothel owners. They sponsored their conquerors, which turned around and stole their lands. The Minoans were being targeted and attacked by identity thieves, and migration was surrounding their city hubs. We know Io fled with son Apophis from the fertility temple at Crete after being impregnated by strange circumstances. This occurred after the Ethiopian invasion. His sons and daughters went to Greece claiming refugee status. Perhaps they were chased out of Egypt, but they took over Greece instead. Six generations later, Danae fled with Perseus from Argos to Seraphos with another unknown baby daddy. He founded Mycena and left his eldest son in Syria. He might have been an identity theft trying to take lands back for Minoan peoples. Two generations after that, Tyrion's princess Alcmene birthed Heracles, another child of Zeus. This family seems to thrive on the idea of being a ward of state, or the whole region is under so much unrest, the family can't keep their own lands or wealth. Or there's just too many of them, there's not enough land and wealth to go around. So they're always looking for someone else to solve their problem. Now, the myth of the birth of Heracles would have you believe she was impregnated by Zeus while the sun was darkened for three days. It's possible she was raped during a wave of conflicts, and the darkness was smoke from fires burning down the region. Nobody knows how long the Trojan Wars were. The resulting child was labeled a child of Zeus because it was the child of an unknown soldier instead of the son of her husband in the region belonging to Zeus. Alcmene was betrothed to her cousin Amphitryon, but he accidentally murdered her father. They don't say how. In punishment, she refused to marry him until he avenged the deaths of her brothers first. Remember, she had like ten brothers and they were all dead. So he went to war against the pirates and thieves for her hand. Likely, these pirates and thieves were related to her half-bastard brother of Phrygia. Remember, the Trojan War was Greece versus the Trojans in Asia Minor. I'm guessing that her illegitimate brother 
was a party to murdering her legitimate brothers to try and inherit Tyrans and start moving Jewish Phrygian population into Greece. Now this was the time she was impregnated by Zeus. To resolve inheritance disputes of the kingdom, Hera made Zeus swear an oath that whoever was born first or next would get to rule. So he agreed, but a premature birth was induced in the wife of the dead king's brother. Zeus wanted a local ruler, not the child of a rape victim or an unknown father. Alcmene was the only one of the direct bloodline left. The men didn't know who the father of the child was, so they weren't going to allow him to rule. Or they did know, and they didn't like the implications of it. Electrion's brother Stathenelus, father of that first male relative to bear a child, ruled as a regent for his son, and exiled the murderer of the last king, his nephew Amphitryon. Now Alcmene failed to give birth to Heracles in time. She was given to her cousin to conclude their betrothal. It sounds like her first son Heracles went with them. They were exiled to Thebes in Boeotia. This city contained murals depicting Mycenaeans in Minoan dress. So the city was destroyed by the Sons of the Seven, according to Aeschylus. They sided with the Persians when they invaded in 4800 BC in Sparta. So were they the migrants, or were they the Islamics founded by Perses related to them? but indoctrinated by Ethiopian Jews after being left in Syria? Or did they apply this oh but were related argument after being taken over by Ethiopians again? So in the end they prioritized the inheritance of a surviving male of the Perseus' line with a woman of known local heritage. She was of the line of Ares. Now we've got a people here who have too many heirs. They're created by taking on the fertility rights and traditions of a foreign migrant peoples. Migrants are continually coming in, claiming land and territories and, and you know, relations to people they may not even be related to in identity theft. It's all following the creation and management of these fertility temples set up in international trade cities. In history, the Jewish and Persians seem to be at the front of this problem. So in myth, Heracles is just the next man in this age-old Islamic race fighting for legitimacy and perceived birthrights, when he was not granted land or wealth from his parents. I think I'll stop here for today. In next month's episode, I'll talk about Heracles' trials and the links he went to to try and prove to others he was worthy of ruling his birthright. Thanks for listening. Until next time.